worship with us today. Uh, could you all please stand with me as we read the call to worship passage together out loud? This morning, we're going to read from Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. So Abraham, could you get that on the screen, please? Thank you. Let's read this out loud together. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. This morning, we are going to worship the Son of God, who is the Word, who became flesh and dwelt among us, who lived the perfect life we could not live, and died the death that we deserved, and rose from the dead, so that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let's worship him together. Sing, Son of God. Son of God, shaper of the stars, you alone. The dweller of my heart, mighty King, how beautiful you are, how beautiful, Son of God, the Father's gift to us, you alone were broken on the altar of love. Precious land, our freedom's in your blood. It's in your blood, Jesus, O oh, Holy One. I sing to you, forgiven Savior. I'm overcome with your great love for me. Son of God, prophecy of old. Son of God, prophecy of old. You alone, redeemer of my soul, come again. And lead your people home. Come lead us home, Jesus, O oh, Holy One. I sing to you, forgiven Savior, I'm overcome. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy of all my praise. You are beautiful. You are beautiful. I will lift up my hands and sing. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy, you are worthy of all my praise. You are beautiful, you are beautiful. I will lift up my hands and sing. Sing Jesus. Jesus, oh holy one. I sing to you, forgiven Savior, I'm overcome with your great love for me. I hear the Savior say, I 
hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid all. As Jesus paid it all. Oh, to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. I dear find, Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone Is Jesus paid it all? To him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him. Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he was white as snow No oh, praise the one Oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Jesus paid it all. Oh, to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the fruit of your holy word. Take your truth planted deep in us, shape and fashion us in your life. That the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O oh Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your.
Heavenly Father, we gather together this morning to proclaim that you are holy, righteous, merciful, just, and good. It is by your very word we are held up that you have breathed life into us today. You are worthy of our praise and worship. We exalt your name today for you are our King and Lord. We thank you, Lord, for not being silent, for your continual care and guidance in our lives we want to continue to lift up those in our church who have been struggling and battling various illness and sickness and disease. We pray for comfort for the families who have walked beside the painful suffering of our loved ones. While we do thank you, Lord, for the rain our state have received these last few months, we also know that it has been a hardship and burden for many of our friends and neighbors. We do want to lift up the neighbors and families who have experienced hardship uh, with the weather, facing housing damages, financial burdens, maybe even loss of life. We also want to pray for those who have experienced or fear layoffs and the uncertainties and stress that come along with it. Lord, we ask may you continue to show yourself to be the provider you promised to be. May our church be quick to act and love during the fallout of these economic stresses. Lord, we also know that there are many believers that are gathered today, this morning, as we all come together to worship you. We are thankful for the various Bible-preaching churches that have you raised in the Bay Area and in California. We want to lift up Pastor David Nguyen of Tri-Valley Chinese Bible Church. We pray for Pastor Dave's continual faithfulness in the Tri-Valley. We pray for Pastor Steve Quinn in Bay Area Chinese Bible Church. We are thankful for their decades of faithfulness in reaching the East Bay. We also want to pray for Pastor Tim Lin and Chinese Independent Chinese Baptist Church right here in Oakland, Chinatown, Lord. And we pray that you sustain them with your grace this morning as well as they have impacted multiple, a multitude of lives right here in Chinatown for many, many decades. Lord, we also want to pray for Minister Theo as he preaches the word this morning. May his faithful preparation bring clear in our hearts and our minds. 
May we carefully and diligently listen and apply the word into our own lives this morning. May you be glorified today. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. You may have a seat. Uh, good morning and welcome to Vinewood CFC. Uh, my name is Dennis. I am one of the pastors here on staff. And um, yeah, we're just really excited for you to be here with us as we worship together. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that we are starting to release our Sunday bulletins online weekly, each Wednesday before service. And you can find our Sunday bulletin. You can just link, uh, click on that QR code behind me. Or you can go to our website, vinewoodcfc.com. Uh, uh, we encourage you to check out our bulletins during the week as it gives you the chance to read and study our sermon passage ahead of time. And as we learn together as a congregation of how to prepare expositionally uh, to ex uh, ex expositionally listen to the word preached. Uh, we do want to welcome all our newcomers this morning. If this is your first time attending uh, our Sunday service, we are very glad that you're here with us. Uh, you would, uh, should have received a physical Get Connected card by one of our welcome team members this morning. Uh, but if by chance you did not receive one, you can grab one that is tucked right behind the seat in front of you. And so if you look, there is a welcome card right there. Feel free to fill that out and turn it into the front when you're done. Or there's also a QR code. And you can just go ahead and if, uh, you can just go ahead and scan that QR code, and it'll link you to our online uh, digital form. And you can uh, feel free to fill out either one of those. We love to get connected to you. We love to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, we'll get, be able to give you more information about our fellowships and what we're about here at Vinewood CFC. I do want to remind everyone that we will be having baptism service next week. On uh, next week, Sunday, April 2nd, it's going to be 1.30 p.m. and it's going to be right here in the sanctuary. So we want to invite you to come and listen to, listen to the testimonies and to celebrate together for the, uh, as we baptize uh, many believers at that time. There will also be a Zoom live stream for this baptism on our website. So for those who might be traveling or unable to come, uh, we, you can join us there, but we would love to invite all of those who are able and willing to be able to come uh, physically in person. Uh, our Vinewood Good Friday service will also take place, uh, will take place on Friday, April 7th. It's going to be at 7.30 p.m., and it's going to be at the Fellowship Hall. So if you exit those double doors to the outside, it will be directly to your left, and that's where the Fellowship Hall is. And we'll be celebrating or be reminded of uh, Jesus' death on the cross as we uh, ha worship together for our Good Friday service. All fellowships will be participating in this event, including our youth group, our Agape youth group. There will also be children's program as well um, if you have any young ones. The Sunday after that will be a combined congregational Easter Sunday celebration service. And so with our uh, Chinese congregation, we'll be celebrating today, uh, together that day. It will be at 10, p uh, 10 a.m. Uh, it will be a sunrise service, not a sunset service. Um, and so we encourage you to, uh, uh, to come a little earlier so you can find parking, grab a seat. It's going to be jam-packed, and we will have our own minister, Theo, preach that service for us. So we hope to see you there. The deadline to sign up for our duck water missions trip has been extended to April 17th. Uh, duck water is in Nevada, and it is a, tri uh, it is a reservation uh, there that we serve the Shoshone tribe. And we have an English congregation of Vinewood um, missions trip there. So if you are interested in that trip, please contact Richard Ho or our admin, Esther um, if you, uh, for more information about that trip. You can also check out our website uh, for more details about uh, the trip and for more information. We also have a prayer meeting every morning at 8 a.m. before Sunday service. So if you did not make it this morning, uh, we will have it next week as well. There's a Zoom link available online, 
and it's also in the upstairs classroom in 202. So if you walk out these doors, again to your left, you go up the set of stairs and go all the way to the, uh, all the, way to the end of that hallway. There's two classrooms. The one at the end of the hallway is 202, and we have a prayer meeting there every Sunday. Uh, we also have an opportunity for those who uh, desire to give offering this morning. We want to encourage you to give via Zelle Pay or PayPal. And information can also be found online on our Give tab. And finally, this is probably a very uh, practical and important announcement uh, to help with the traffic control as we are switching congregations. So as we as the English congregation leave, the Chinese congregation is coming into worship. We ask if you would just please leave the middle area of the, of the foyer and also just outside uh, empty so, they can, so we can help. Uh, so uh, there will be a kind of space for the Chinese congregation to come in. So if you plan on socializing and fellowshipping after our service, which we love and we're just excited that you're staying behind, we'd ask you if you can just either kind of move to the side, leaving the middle open, or to the deck of the backyard or to the side, and we'll have all that area open up. Feel free once their service has started that you can move back up to the front because sometimes we do get a little loud. But in the kind of transition time, if we can leave that middle open, uh, that would help our brothers and sisters in the Chinese congregation tremendously. Uh, that's all we have this morning. Uh, so I would love to invite uh, Minister Theo up as he continues our Matthew sermon series. Hey. Good morning, everyone. Uh, very happy to bring the word of God to you this morning. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. As you turn to Matthew chapter 27, we'll be looking in verses 11 to 26 this morning, but I'd like to ask you a question as you turn there. Have you ever been ashamed of identifying as a Christian? For those of you who believe or profess to believe, have you ever felt ashamed of identifying as a Christian? I'd like to tell you a story of high school me. 15 years ago, California voted on what was called Proposition 8. It was a surprise. The state of California decided to not recognize what was then called gay marriage. Surprisingly, the most, one of the most liberal states in this country voted it down 15 years ago. As you know, by now, the issue is settled in our country. The Supreme Court has ruled in the Obergefell decision. It is legal. It is recognized across the countries at a federal level. That's how things are. But for me, as a high school senior in 2011, I took the required course, Government, Government and Economics, GovEcon. And uh, our teacher, this is 2011, so three years after Prop 8, our teacher had a baby, so she was on maternity leave, and we got a long-term sub. And this long-term sub was very interesting. You knew exactly where she stood. Her face was an open book. She decided to have a debate in our GovEcon class on, you guessed it, gay marriage. What do you think, high schoolers? And of course, no one wants the no on gay marriage side, so she had to volunteer someone, and for some reason, she picked me. Now, again, 17, 18-year-old me, undecided on the issue, uncomfortable with it. I'm a pastor's kid. I, was, I still am a pastor's kid. I knew what I <laughs> was supposed to think and supposed to say, but honestly, I was not settled on that issue. Uh, I had not yet taken the time to look closely at scriptural arguments. Uh, I was still unconvinced in that regard. And of course, there was peer pressure. It was the absolute minority view in my high school to be against gay marriage. So I had a hard time because of that, and also because the person who got selected to take the opposing side was a girl that I had a crush on. Now, <laughs> it was a very interesting debate. And through the 30-minute period, I tried my best to present all the non-biblical arguments that I could give, you know, the utilitarian arguments, uh, the practicality arguments, like things like that, you know, right? Everything aside from the Bible, everything that I've just like heard on the news, I've heard other people say, I just like parroted it back. And the clock went in my favor because when I gave one argument, it ended and it sounded like I won. And so it was decided in our GovEcon class that we should be opposed to gay marriage. And oh, it was not good for that, my relationship with that girl. But after that, after that class, the period ended, I walked out and I said, hey, uh, just so you know, like, I don't really believe everything that I said. And she was like, oh, no, it's fine. I get it, blah, 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 right? 
at that moment, at very many levels, I felt ashamed as a high school pastor's kid to be a Christian on many levels. I was afraid of what people would think of me. I was afraid of what people would think of Jesus because at that time, I was still concerned that it made Jesus look like a prude. I was concerned about my social standing and my peers. This morning, we're going to read about Jesus' trial before Pontius Pilate. Pilate had the opportunity to tell the truth about Jesus. I want to calm your nerves this morning. Today is not a culture warrior message. I don't believe in those. That's not my concern. My concern is also not to tell you how to win an apologetics argument. My concern this morning is to ask you, where's your heart? Where's your heart? Will you tell the truth about Jesus when you are challenged or given the opportunity? Or will you back away and be ashamed? This morning, I have a bit of a preaching dilemma because what you're going to see as you read this passage is Jesus is not the main character. Jesus is the main character of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is the main character of the Scriptures. But when you take this passage as a standalone passage, you're going to find that Pilate is the main character. All of Matthew's narrative details are about Pilate. In fact, nothing happens in terms of the plot. You already know Jesus is going to the cross. You already know that he's been condemned by the Jewish religious leaders. All that's left is he has to be confirmed by Pilate. And you're going to see as we read that Matthew wants to play omniscient narrator. He wants to tell you what's happening behind the scenes, what's going on in Pilate's mind. Everything is about Pilate. So the difficulty is the fact that on the text side, the emphasis is on Pilate. But as a preacher, I need to tell you about Jesus. I need to preach the gospel. So this is me explaining the balance of today's message. It's going to be heavier on the explanation of the passage, but we will get to the heart issues, the gospel, I promise you. Please bear with me on that. This morning, the main idea is tell the truth about Jesus. Tell the truth. When confronted with pressure from the crowds, when confronted with pressure from a family member or a friend or a loved one, your coworkers, your manager, I want to encourage you this morning, be ready to tell the truth about Jesus. Let's see what Matthew writes, beginning in verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, Pilate, and the governor said to him, or asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So that when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. So the governor asked again, said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. This is the word of the Lord. So I want to take this in two sections. First, I want to talk about Pilate's folly. We're going to take apart Matthew's account. Let's see behind the scenes what's going on. What is Pilate's folly? The first thing you have to know about Pilate is his situation. You need to know his background, his situation, what's going on. So, and this is the sub points for this point, just so you know. First, you need to know his situation. Pilate was a short-term governor. He was only in power for 10 years. And any governor of the Roman Empire's only concern was to stay in power. They just wanted to keep their jobs, not unlike some other government officials. 
So they had to do everything that they could to, number one, keep Rome happy, and then number two, keep their subjects happy. And Pilate was notorious, according to several historical accounts, for being very bad at both things, especially when it came to dealing with the Jewish people. He was the governor over Judea and Samaria, and very often these very religious people had uprisings. They had insurrections. They wanted to rebel, and multiple times Pilate went too hard. He killed too many people. And so his job was always threatened. Ultimately, Pilate lost his position because he dealt with one insurrection too harshly. So when we look at his present situation, which is right in the middle of his term as governor, you have to recognize Pilate feels the pressure. He has already had a bad track record for at least five years, and here is an opportunity. He gets to win points with the people. Here is this person, Jesus called the Christ, who is put in front of him, and he has a choice. He can say, look, I can score points with the people by doing what they want, or I can be a judge like I'm supposed to. Now let's look at his knowledge. Look with me in verses 14 and 18. In verse 14, Jesus is, sorry, in verses 11 through 14, Jesus is standing there listening to them, accusing him. And you have to remember, what has just happened is Jesus had just gone through an illegal trial the previous night, and he was beaten, he was mocked, he was spit on, he was tortured. So when he is standing there that morning in front of Pilate, his face is messed up. Pilate could see dried blood on his face, and Pilate is not a stupid guy. He looks at the bloodied Jesus, and he can see this is not a normal trial. This is not a normal question about a normal person. There has to be a reason why the Jewish religious leaders already roughed him up so badly. And then you look at how they gave so many different things. Verse 13, Pilate said to Jesus, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? Do you not hear how many different things they are saying about you? If you think about the past few weeks when Pastor Dennis preached on that trial, you remember they all gave conflicting things, conflicting testimonies. No one agreed to anyone. And Pilate sitting there is hearing all these different things, different charges that people are bringing against Jesus. And he could tell by that exchange, these people are just making things up. They're emotional. They conflict with one another. They're heated. It's all ad hominem. There is no substance like this. But he notices in verse 14 that when he asks Jesus, what are you going to do? Do you not hear everything they're saying? Jesus stands there silently and Matthew tells us the governor was greatly amazed. In Matthew's gospel, that word that gets translated amazed is always positive. In every single instance, it is positive. Even if you don't count this one, it's nine out of ten. There's very strong reason for all these three things to be convinced as readers that Pilate knew. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. Pilate knew that he did not deserve to be condemned. More than that, he had what we would call divine testimony. Look with me in verse 19. While he's sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. When you think about their context, dreams were a very common way of divine messaging. It was how the gods would speak to the people. This was in Greek mythology. This was in Roman mythology. And this was also in Old Testament theology. God also spoke to many people through dreams. You can even think about Joseph at the beginning of Matthew's gospel. The angel tells Joseph in a dream, don't divorce Mary. Dreams are commonly accepted in the old world and in Matthew's gospel as a real method of divine communication. So we have to conclude with a certain level of confidence that this was a genuine divine warning. So the fact that Pilate was an intelligent person who could read the room and the fact that his wife had given him a divinely related message, all of these things led Pilate to conclude Jesus is innocent. And that's why, look with me in verse 23. Thank you for bearing with my jumping around. That's why when the crowd calls for Jesus' crucifixion, Pilate asks, why? What evil has he done? What has he done that deserves the worst punishment that the Roman Empire has to offer? Pilate sees that there is nothing. He knows. And because he knew, he had the opportunity as the judge to tell the truth. 
When you think about a judge, what's a judge supposed to do? A judge is supposed to render a fair verdict, right? A judge is supposed to look at the evidence and make a true verdict in light of the evidence without any sort of partiality. And that was Pilate's first option, to tell the truth, to say, look, I hear what you're saying. I disagree with you. I see nothing wrong in this man. He has done nothing wrong, certainly nothing to deserve the death penalty, so I am going to absolve him. I will declare him not guilty. That was his first option. But Pilate is a smart man. He also knew that if he declared Jesus innocent, this would offend the Sanhedrin. This would offend the religious leaders in Jerusalem. He knew that this is what they wanted. Look in verse 18, please. Because Pilate knew that it was out of envy that they, the religious leaders, had delivered Jesus up. He knew. He knew the agenda. He knew what was at stake. He knew, again, his situation. He knew that his position was already at risk. He knew that his governorship was going down, so he needed to do his math very carefully because he found a second option. There was another way that Pilate could prevent the wrongful killing of an innocent man without sacrificing his job. He could grant Jesus what we would call amnesty. Amnesty does not require him to say that the religious leaders are wrong, but it does allow him to let Jesus walk away free with only the punishment he'd already gotten so far. And he found the perfect occasion. Look with me in verse 15. Now at the feast, which is the Passover feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. He had this tradition. Every Passover feast, he would offer one prisoner of their choice. And again, Pilate was very smart. He did his math. He had heard about Jesus coming in several days before what we would call Palm Sunday, their triumphal entry, whatever you want to call it. And he heard that this Jesus walked into the city with a huge fan base. So many fans. They loved him. And so he thought, you know, if I just bring this back to the people, look, like maybe the religious establishment doesn't like Jesus. Maybe they don't want him. But look, he's a popular figure. The people love Jesus. And so he is counting on the people. He asks the crowd, who should I release for you? Because in his mind, of course Jesus. They love Jesus. And he's done nothing wrong. Win-win. He missed a few things in his calculations, like me on every one of my math tests. He forgot that the people who came in with Jesus were Galileans. The people who came in with Jesus on the day of the triumphal entry were outsiders. They did not belong in Jerusalem. They were visitors. They were tourists. They were here for the Passover feast. So while you're sitting there, while everyone else is with their families celebrating the Passover, who's in the crowd? Pilate didn't realize. He couldn't tell Jerusalem from Galilee. He didn't realize that the people who were in that crowd that morning watching Jesus' trial were Jerusalemites. They were establishment Jews. They were pro-temple, pro-Sanhedrin, pro-chief priests, anti-Jesus. Who is this Galilean? Who is this backwater person coming in here, acting all big, wanting to teach us, opposing our religious leaders? These are people who the leadership could bend. Verse 20, now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Pilate miscalculated the crowd, and he miscalculated the leadership's savvy. The leaders knew what they were doing. The leaders knew how to play the game better than Pilate. Pilate was still playing 3D chess, guys. The religious leaders are playing 4D chess. The crowd chose Barabbas. By choosing to be politically savvy, by choosing to not tell the truth when he knew the truth, when he knew his obligation, and instead trying to play games to win both sides, Pilate lost. And the last bit of his folly is that he thought he could be clean. He thought the responsibility would not fall on him. Look with me in verse 24. When Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, 
He took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Pilate, to save himself, sacrificed an innocent man. And symbolically, by washing his hands, he declared himself innocent. He said, this responsibility is not mine. This man's blood is not on my hands. And you know what? The crowd agrees. The crowd takes an oath. The crowd says, yeah, we take the responsibility, and the responsibility will be passed on even to our kids, even though they're not even here. And so Pilate feels really good. Because in Roman custom, he's clean. And the Jews have said, you're clean. Pilate has won. He thinks. But look with me in verse 26. See, the grammar betrays him. Matthew tells us what everyone deep down knows. Then he, Pilate, released for them Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Who is the subject of the verbs? The subject of the verbs is Pilate. He released Barabbas. He, having scourged Jesus, he delivered Jesus to be crucified. Matthew wants you, the reader, to know that Pilate was a fool. He thought he could walk away unscathed, untouched, not liable for what he had done to Jesus. When every person with common sense knows The only reason that Jesus was crucified is because Pilate neglected his duty to tell the truth. Before we move on to talk about us, I would like to draw out some root issues. I see two. There are two root issues in Pilate's experience. What happens with him? The first is he was willing to neglect doing what he knew was right. He was willing to compromise on what he knew was right. And as you know, in James chapter 4, James says, whoever knows what he ought to do and chooses not to do it, that is sin. It is what we call classically the sin of omission. It's the good things that we know that we are supposed to do. The opportunity to help someone, to comfort someone, to speak the truth. When you see that opportunity and you know it's yours to take and you decide, not today. He omitted the good that he knew he needed to do. And second, classically we call this fear of man. In more common terms, we can call it self-preservation. He wanted to make sure that people thought well of him. He was concerned about what the people might think of him if he said what he knew they didn't want to hear. So on a shallow level, this is about people-pleasing. But on a deeper level, this is about his job. This is about his self-preservation. Think about it. He doesn't care what they think, except for the fact that his job is dependent on them. What Pilate's concern is ultimately not his popularity. Pilate's concern is his self-preservation. To put it another way, he wasn't concerned about Jerusalem. He is concerned about Rome. He was concerned about what his bosses would say if they saw, look, Pontius, another riot. That's the fifth one this week, and it's only Tuesday. That's too much. So he was afraid for his job. And I think that you and I can relate to Pilate on several levels, can't we? I want to talk for the rest of our time about our duty. We saw Pilate's folly Now let's think about our duty, because the thing is, you and I will very probably be put in a very similar position to Pilate. Let me explain like this. You're not going to sit as judge. You're not going to be the Roman governor over Jerusalem. That's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is that there will be moments in your life when you will be in a group of people, or even just you one-on-one. You're talking with people who have already pronounced judgment on Jesus, and you are someone who knows the truth. These people have pronounced judgment on Jesus one way or another. They have already decided in their hearts that he is wrong, that the religion that comes after him is wrong, that the church that stands for him as a pillar and buttress of the truth is wrong. They have already decided in their hearts that Jesus deserves to be condemned. And in that moment, you will function in a way very similar to Pilate. Will you go with the crowds 
or will you tell the truth? Will you bend to the crowds or will you tell the truth? My intention, again, as I said before, is not to make you culture warriors, and it is also not to give you an apologetics workshop, not to deal any of those things. As I said in the beginning, my concern is, where is your heart? Are you ashamed of the truth? Don't be ashamed of who Jesus is. Let's talk about our duty. First, what do you know? What do you know? Because the thing is, Pilate knew in a 10-minute interaction with Jesus, just watching people yell at him, watching Jesus stand there quietly, just doing the math, Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. But the thing is, you and I know that Jesus was not merely innocent. Jesus was not merely innocent. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You and I know that he is more than the king of the Jews. He is the king of creation. All things were made through him and by him and for him. Everything continues to exist. He is the radiance of the invisible God, the exact imprint of his nature. He is the word that became flesh that dwelt among us. He is the creator who stepped into creation. We know all this. And more than knowing that he is the one true king who has come to save his people who deserve to die, we also know that the word who became flesh was not just innocent, He was perfect. Innocence implies the lack of wrongdoing. Jesus was more than that. He was tempted in every way as we are, and yet without sin, but he was more than that. He was perfect. He was righteous the way that we were supposed to be. He was loving and compassionate and merciful the way that we were supposed to be. Patient, wholly concerned with God's glory. He lived the perfect, righteous life that you and I are supposed to live. You and I know that he died the death that we deserved in our place at the hands of the religious leaders under Pontius Pilate. And you and I know that God the Father vindicated Jesus because he did not stay dead. But on the third day, Jesus rose from the grave. God accepted his sacrifice. God proved that Jesus is, in fact, everything he said that he was. And we know that Jesus now sits at the right hand of God, waiting for the day that he will come back and bring his kingdom here for good and make everything right again. The apostles, in their early sermons, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, said, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no under name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You and I know too much. You and I cannot claim ignorance. Pilate has some level of ignorance. He knew too much as well, but we know even more. This side of the cross, with the complete scriptures, you and I have too much knowledge to act like we cannot speak the truth about Jesus. So who do you fear? Whom do you fear? Do you fear people? Do you fear looking like a fool, outdated, obsolete, medieval? Do you fear being out of step, being rejected, having a fractured relationship, getting ostracized, getting passed over for a promotion? Because I get that. I I fear that too. Look, just because you're a pastor doesn't mean that you don't care what your non-Christian friends think of you. I, I am still fearful of that. I hope you understand that I'm not here telling you like the holier to the less holy. I'm telling you as this is something I'm working on and I want to encourage all of you, grow out of that. Let's all grow out of that. Because the thing is, if you are too afraid to tell them the truth about Jesus, who else will? If there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved, who else will tell them the name? Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, if they do not hear, how can they believe? Because all they've heard is the lies that are outside of us. All they've heard are the people yelling at them on the streets and telling them that God hates gay people. All they've heard are all the people in church leadership who have broken trust, committed adultery, hurt kids. That's all they hear. But what if they heard from you? Someone whom they know, whom they trust. They've seen your life. They've seen the hints of godliness in you. They've seen the hints of Christ in you. What if you're the one that tells them the truth? 
What if you can calmly and gently explain the gospel to them? Because the thing is, let me tell you, these contemporary spicy issues are not the main issue. These are tangential. They're peripheral. Even if you gave them every single good answer that you could, that won't save them. You know why? Because what you think about homosexuality will not save you. It's the gospel that saves. They don't need to hear those answers. They need to hear the truth about Jesus. If you need to talk about those things on the way to Jesus, fine. But explain it in a way where it becomes very clear to them, look, I know that you care about this, I care about this too, but there's something I care about even more because I care about you. And I want to tell you the truth about Jesus. Don't fear people. Jesus in this gospel tells us to fear God instead. Because it is not only their souls that hang in the balance. It is actually your soul as well. Hear Jesus' words, Matthew chapter 10. He says, Whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Some people, like Peter, as Pastor Dennis preached a few weeks ago, will outright deny Jesus. Others will deny Jesus in a manner that's more similar to Pilate. When we know the good that we are supposed to do and choose not to do it. When we have the opportunity to tell the truth about Jesus and instead decide, well, let's be political here. Let's be clean here. Let's be safe here. Let's not endanger this here. We have a good thing going here. And because of our fear of man, we decide to deny Jesus. Not outrightly, but implicitly. If you have denied Jesus, like Peter, or like Pilate, you should repent as I've had to repent several times in my life. You should repent because this is not a light matter. Because you cannot pretend like you did not know that it was your time to speak. That it was your time to rely on the Holy Spirit to help you tell the truth about Jesus to that person who needed to hear it. So I want to encourage you this morning. Tell the truth about Jesus. Consider the fact that the gospel actually, is not dependent on you. See what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. He says in Romans 1, verse 16, he is not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. What you see in Paul's wording right here, just as a brief reading, is that the gospel is not about your power. The gospel is not about how eloquent you are, how savvy you are, how clearly you can communicate. Look, you should communicate clearly, do your hard work, practice, study, ask one of us, ask someone who's like your small group leader or something on how to be clear with the gospel. Don't get me wrong, we have to work hard on that. But the thing is, ultimately, the power of the gospel does not rest on you. You are the instrument, but the power of the gospel is God himself. If you think about it, uh, you are the power tool and God is the electricity, okay? You don't work unless God's power is flowing through you. So the thing is, when you speak the truth, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of and wondering, well, am I doing it right? Am I doing it enough? All you have to do is think, am I being faithful, period? Have I decided to tell the truth about Jesus right now, period? That is all that is demanded of you because the power of God is expressed through the gospel, and the power of God won't be expressed unless you say the gospel, unless you tell the truth about Jesus. It is the power of God for the salvation of anyone who believes, even the person that you think would never in a million years come around. See God work. Tell the truth. Second, see what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 to 24. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, 
a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You don't need to make the gospel appealing. You don't need to be clever. All you have to do is accept the fact that the gospel does look foolish. God speaks through Paul in his inspired scriptures. Yes, the gospel is foolish. God looks foolish. God looks weak. But in that, we see Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. God intervening, stepping down into creation, saving us when we seemed unsavable, loving us when we were unlovable, redeeming us when we were unredeemable. God shows himself in the gospel. You don't need to be clever. You don't need to give the best answers. You just need to tell the truth about Jesus. This is a heart-level issue. Please don't be ashamed of your Savior. In your faithful truth-telling, you will see the power of God. I want to close with what Paul says in the next chapter. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. In your attempts to be savvy and to be apologetically clever, you can live out the fear of man just as much. Just because you like arguing about theology and about politics does not make you someone who fears God. A man or woman who fears God is someone who wants the power of God shown in their lives. To tell the truth about Jesus and see God's power. Let's pray. Our God, we humble ourselves before you this morning and we ask for your grace. We recognize that we are small and weak and that our best laid plans often fail. God, but when you speak, things happen. You make all things happen according to the counsel of your will. You are all powerful and you are sovereign. And so we put our trust in you this morning. We ask that you would lessen our trust in ourselves and our own abilities and put our confidence in you. We ask that you would give us great assurance in Christ, great love for him, and great confidence in who he is and all that he has done for us. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Let's all stand in his final song. Was lost. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran, I held that race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless day and led me to I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Yeah.
to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power I work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever amen thanks for worshiping alongside with us this morning have a very blessed week it's always been an honor, it's always an honor and privilege for me and Theo to pastor y'all love you bye